Chapter 13, run as fast as you can. Still moving quietly so as not to wake her sister, Anne-Marie sped down the stairs and through the kitchen door. Her foot caught the loose step and she faltered for a moment, righting herself, then dashed across the ground to the place where her mother lay. Mama, she called desperately. Mama! Okay, that's enough out of you. What's that noise on your phone? It's my phone. <clears throat> Mama said, raising her head. I'm all right. But Mama, Anne-Marie asked, kneeling beside her, what's wrong? What happened? Her mother pulled herself to a sitting position. She winced in pain. I'm all right, really, don't worry. And the Rosins are with Henrik's. That's the important thing. She smiled a little, though her face was drawn with pain, and she bit her lip, the smile fading. We got there quite quickly, even though it was still so dark and it was difficult for the Rosins, not knowing the path. Henrik was there waiting on the boat, and he took them aboard and down below so quickly to the cabin that they were invisible in an instant. He said the others were already there. Peter got them there safely too. So I turned and hurried home. I was so anxious to get back to you girls. I should have been more careful. Talking slowly, she brushed some grass and dirt from her hands. Can you believe it? I was very nearly here. Well, maybe just halfway when I tripped over the root and went sprawling. Mama sighed. So clumsy, she said, as if she were scolding herself. I'm afraid my ankle is broken, Anne-Marie. Thank goodness it's nothing worse. An ankle mends. And I am home and the rosins are with Henrik. You should have seen me, Anne-Marie, she said, shaking her head with a wild look. Your proper mama crawling inch by inch. I probably looked like a drunkard. She reached for Anne-Marie's arm. Here, let me lean on you. I think if you support me on this side, I can make it all the way up to the house. Goodness, what a clumsy fool I am. Here, let me put my arm over your shoulders. You're such a good, strong, brave girl. Now, very slowly, there. Mama's face was white with pain. Anne Marie could see it even though the faint light of the approaching dawn, even through the faint light of the approaching dawn. She hobbled, leaving, leaning heavily on her daughter, pausing again and again toward the house. When we get inside, I'll have a cup of tea, and then we'll call the doctor. I'll tell him that I fell on the stairs. You'll have to help me wash away the grass and twigs. Here, Anne-Marie, let me rest for a minute. They had reached the house, and Mama sank down to the steps and sat. She looked, took several deep breaths. Anne-Marie sat beside her and held her hand. Mama, I was so worried when you didn't come back. Mama, Mama nodded. I knew you would be. I thought of you, worrying as I dragged myself along. But here I am, safe with you now. Everything is fine. What time is it? It must be 4.30 or close to it. They will sail soon. Mama turned her head and gazed across the meadow to the sea and the vast sky above it. There were no stars now, only the gray pale sky with pinkness at its border. Soon they will be safe too. Anne-Marie relaxed, relaxed. She stroked her mother's hand and looked down at the discolored swollen ankle. Mama, what is this? She asked suddenly, reaching into the grass at the foot of the steps. Mama looked. She gasped. Oh, my Lord, she said. Anne-Marie picked it up. She recognized it now, knew what it was. It was the packet that Peter had given to Mr. Rosin. Mr. Rosin tripped on the step, remember? It must have fallen from his pocket. We'll have to save it and give it back to Peter. Anne-Marie handed it to her mother. Do you know what it is? Her mother didn't answer. Her face was stricken. She looked at the path and down at her ankle. It's important, isn't it, Mama? It was for Uncle Henrik. I remember Peter said it was very important. I heard him tell Mr. Rosin. Her mother tried to stand but fell back against the steps with a groan. My God, she murmured again. It may have all have been for nothing. Anne-Marie took the packet from her mother's hand and stood. I will take it, she said. I know the way, and it's almost light now. I can run like the wind. Mama spoke quickly, her voice tense. Anne-Marie, go into the house and get the small basket on the table. Quickly, quickly, put an apple into it and some cheese. Put this packet underneath. Do you understand? Hurry. Anne-Marie did instantly as she was told. The basket, the packet at the bottom. She covered it with a napkin, then some wrapped cheese and an apple. She glanced around the kitchen, saw some bread and added that. The little basket was full and she took it to where her mother was. You must run to the boat. If anyone should stop you, who would stop me? Anne-Marie, you understand how dangerous this is. If any soldiers see you, if they stop you, you must pretend to be nothing more than a little girl, a silly, empty-headed little girl talk, taking lunch to a fisherman, a foolish uncle who forgot his bread and cheese. Mama, what is in the bottom? But her mother still didn't answer the question. Go, she said firmly. Go right now and run as fast as you can. Anne-Marie kissed her mother quickly, grabbed the basket from her mother's lap, turned and ran toward the path. On the dark path. 
Only now, entering the woods on the footpath, did Anne-Marie realize how cold the dawn was. She had watched and helped earlier as the others donned sweaters, jackets, and coats, and she had peered into the night, following them with her eyes as they moved silently off, bulky in their garments, blankets in their arms. But she wore only a light sweater over her cotton dress. Though the, through, though the October day later would be warmed by sunlight, now it was gray, chilly, and damp. She shivered. The path curved and she could no longer look behind her and see the clearing of the farmhouse outlined against the pale sky and the lightning meadow, lightning meadow beyond. Now they were, there were only the dark woods ahead. Underfoot, the path latticed with thick roots hidden under the fallen leaves was invisible. She felt her way with her feet, trying not to stumble. The handle of the straw basket scratched her arm through her sweater. She shifted it and tried to run. She thought of a story she had often told to Kirsty as they cuddled in bed at night. Once upon a time, there was a little girl, she told herself silently, who had a beautiful red cloak. Her mother had made it for her. She wore it so often that everyone called her Little Red Riding Hood. Kirsty would always interrupt there. Why was it called a Red Riding Hood? Kirsty would ask. Why didn't they just call her Little Red Cloak? Well, it had a hood that covered your, her head. She had beautiful curls like you, Kirsty. Maybe someday Mama will make you a coat with a hood to cover your curls and keep you warm. But why, Kirsty would ask, was it a widening hood? Was she widening a horse? Maybe she had a horse that she rode sometimes, but not in this story. Now stop interrupting every minute. Anne-Marie smiled, feeling her way through the dark, remembering how Kirsty always interrupted stories to ask questions. Often, she just wanted to make the story last longer. The story continued. One day, the little girl's mother said, I want you to take a basket of food to your grandmother. She is sick in bed. Come, let me tie your red cloak. The grandmother lived in the woods, didn't she? Kirsty would ask. In the dangerous woods where wolves lived. Anne-Marie heard a small noise, a squirrel perhaps, or a rabbit scampering nearby. She paused, stood still on the path, and smiled again. Kirsty would have been frightened. She would have grabbed Anne-Marie's hand and said, A wolf! But Anne-Marie knew that these woods were not like the woods in the story. There were no wolves or bears or tigers, none of the beasts that populated Kirsty's vivid imagination. She hurried on. Still, they were very dark, these woods. Anne-Marie had never followed this path in the dark before. She had told her mother she would run, and she tried. He here, the path turned. She knew the turning well, though it seemed different in the dark. If she turned to the left, it would take her to the road, out where it would be lighter, wider, more traveled, but more dangerous, too. Someone could see her on the road. At this time of the dawn, other fishermen would be on the road hurrying to their boats for the long day at sea, and there might be soldiers. She turned to the right and headed deeper into the woods. It was why Mama and Peter had needed to guide those who were strangers here, the Razins and the others. A wrong turn would have taken them into danger. So Little Red Riding Hood carried the basket of food and hurried along the woods. It was a lovely morning, and the birds were singing Little Red Riding Hood sang too as she walked. Sometimes she changed that part of the story, telling it to Kirsty. Sometimes it was raining or even snowing in the woods. Sometimes it was evening with long, frightening shadows so that Kirsty, listening, would snuggle closer and wrap her arms around Anne-Marie. But now, telling it to herself, she wanted sunlight and bird songs. Here, the path widened and flattened. It was the path where the woods opened on one side and the path curved beside the meadow at the edge of the sea. Here, she could run, and she did. Here, in daylight, there would be cows in the meadow, and on summer afternoons, Anne-Marie would always stop by the fence and hold out handfuls of grass, which the curious cows would take with their rough tongues. Here, her mother had told her, Mama would always stop, too, as a child, walking to school. Her dog, Trophis, would whip would wriggle under the fence and run around in the meadow, barking excitedly, trying to chase the cows who always ignored him. The meadow was empty now and colorless in the half light. She could hear the churning sea beyond and see the wash of daylight to the east over Sweden. She ran as fast as she could, searching with her eyes for the place where, ahead where the path would re-enter the woods in its final segment, which led to town here. The bushes were overgrown and it was difficult to see the path here, but she found the entrance beside the high blueberry bushes. How often she had stopped here in late summer to pick a handful of the sweet berries. Her hands and mouth would be blue afterwards, Mama always laughing when she came home. Now in dark again, as the trees and bushes closed around her, she had to move more slowly, though she still tried to run.